President Ramaphosa of South Africa is 68 in 2021. The President of Zimbabwe is 78. The President of Ghana is 77. And the President of the good old United States of America is 78. All of this while the average age of retirement is said to be 65. Today we're asking the simple question, should government officials have an age limit when it comes to their occupying positions of leadership or should they start making space for younger leaders? Now to add your opinions to the discussion we're having today, be sure to follow at Mountaintop Productions on all social media platforms and in particular, be sure to subscribe, like and comment on our YouTube channel at Mountaintop Productions. To give us a clearer image of what we're talking about today, take a look at the following insert. At a whopping 88 years of age, Paul B. of Cameroon has been serving his nation as a president since 1982. That is 39 years as the lead of this particular nation. Lebanon's president is not too far behind at the age of 87. These leaders have lived through World War II, the fall of the Berlin Wall. They have lived in a world with no cell phones, TVs or even computers. Yet, they are expected to lead their nations into prosperity and prepare them for the future. Not isolated to these two nations, the average age for a president in the USA is said to be 55 years old. Their current president is their oldest president to be inaugurated. This phenomenon exists even in our very own nation too. At some point, at the age of 90, IFP leader Mangosutu Buteles was the oldest member of parliament. In 2018, only 6% of parliamentarians in South Africa were under the age of 35. In a country that consists of about 37% youth, it begs the question, should government officials have an age limit set for them to avoid gatekeeping leadership opportunities for youth? Or is there wisdom with age that requires government officials to be older in order for them to lead their countries? As usual on the show, we're joined by four amazing panelists who will be sharing their opinions and their bits of truth with us. We're joined by Minkateko Machoko, Final year law student, winner of the Watson Institute Social Entrepreneurship Pitch Competition. Minkato, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having awesome me. Awesome stuff. Thank you so much for coming through. We also have Mfumo Bamuza, a debater and debate coach, a social activist, as well as a TikTok creator. Mfumo, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Awesome stuff. I'm yeah. good, thanks. We have Lindo Gute Mabaso, Top 6 One Day Leader Season 8, Best speaker in Africa in the 2020 Pan-African Debate Open. Lindo Gould, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Awesome stuff. Last but certainly not least, we've got Tato Mokwena, a debate coach and mentor, former SRC leader as well as activist. How are you feeling about today's topic, Tato? I'm feeling quite excited, actually. Quite excited. Let's get right into it then. Minka Tego, so we're asking a very simple question, right? Um, should age matter when it comes to leadership or should we open the door more to have more young leaders occupying the space? Okay. Primarily we're talking about the issue of age because there's a vacuum of youth leadership. My thoughts are that there's supposed to be a hybrid. The leadership of the country must be representative of the demographic that exists within that country. Mm -hmm. In South Africa and in Africa as a whole, that is not the case. That is why we're talking about age in the first place. I think edge should not operate as a limitation to who can lead and who can't lead. Mm -hmm. So that is why we need to create spaces for more youth-centered leadership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you hold the same opinion that we should have a hybrid environment where the leadership represents the demographics of the country? I think um, choosing what the leadership looks like or rather prescribing whether there should be a hybrid or some quota isn't necessarily the solution for me. Um, I think Things that try to, sorry, not things, but um, I think measures such as age or quotas are very superficial. So I think the best way to decide on leadership is on looking at the substance of candidates and therefore deciding whether a person is in fact qualified to lead based on their ideas, based on their knowledge and their mm. understanding and what their potential contributions mm. are. Very interesting um, view that uh, Lindo Gutler comes with, that we should look at the substance what if the substance is 78 years of age? Tato, your views on the topic? My views are not the same, very different. And the reason I think I disagree slightly with Lindo specifically is that I think the reality is, no matter the substance of our political leaders, they're by and large older of age, right? And this is not just our president. This is 
throughout our kind of officials. Many of our officials are just old. So the, are you then saying that like young people, and when I say young people, I don't mean specifically 20 year olds, right? Mm -hmm. We have a shortage of 40 year olds, right? Mm -hmm. So are there no qualified 40 year olds who can do the job that a 78 year old is doing? Right, so yes, the, the quality is important, but the quality isn't measured only by age, right? And the reality is, and I'm sure that's not what you're saying, but the reality is right now, we have more old people than we have younger people. Mm. Should it matter, Mfumo? I mean, <coughs> def young? definitely, I think um, the conversation for me is more towards Amikadeko because I do think we need to strike a balance, you know, um, because Tatu does raise a good point around their like when you speak of age we and when you speak of young people we're thinking more in the 20s getting into the 30s you know but i do think firstly we need to define what young looks like especially in leadership and in governance but also i do think that striking a balance because it's part of like democratic principles you know mm -hmm. one of them is representation so we need to have young people being represented in governance young people being represented in leadership and just being able to strike that balance which i don't think that many african countries specifically or actually any country is doing well because there is just a like one extreme end of governance in terms of age and it's usually people who are elder you know mm. yeah. i mean the makes an interesting argument um, that we should look at substance more than we look at politics of age, do we, and this is something I'm throwing to all of you, do we have the type of young people right now, it can be in the country, it can be on the continent, all over the world, do we have the caliber of young people who are able to lead? And I think that will lead us to, to the next question I'm going to ask you. I'll just throw it to you, Tajo. Sure. One, I think we're in the room. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But yeah. two, but yeah, I, I do think we have the caliber of, of young people, right? Because when you look at corporate South Africa, for example, right? Mm. Um, and again, I'll take it back to 40-year-olds and, mm. and lower, right? Many people in corporate South Africa who are leading is institution in, in those institutions are 40, in their 40s, mm. right? Whereas in government, people in their 40s are considered young or are not part of the government at all, mm. right? Which means that if someone who's 40 is not at all considered, someone who's 30 is not even in the question, right? So for me, the, the question of quality isn't one, isn't the question that should exist. The, is, the issue is, we do, people don't want young people in spaces of government, I think. Mm. I think the old people in politics are holding on to power mm. for I, reasons I don't understand. I think I have a, I, I definitely agree with Sato in terms of there be, being young people who to a fair degree are capacitated in some respect. But I think we need to honestly zone in on the nature of responsibilities people have, lest we mistaken some sort of like expertise in a, in a particular field mm. as qualifying you to be a good leader in a certain respect or contributor in a certain respect. For example, being like a great business mogul doesn't make you an excellent candidate to run a country and care about the numerous needs of individuals. Which is why I think, again, prescriptive measures aren't very specific and don't speak to the substance of people, especially when trying to match them with the kind of responsibilities that they have. Which is why even if we have quota systems, for example, individuals that are placed there aren't either given enough of a platform to make an impact or are sometimes not even individuals who are trained in line, of the, in line with the responsibilities that they're supposed to fulfill. And therefore quotas end up just being a measure that sounds nice as far as prescriptive measures go, but that don't but doesn't also do much as far as substance of candidates is concerned. Mm. So the caliber and character of young people that we have, in your opinion, um, provide, could possibly provide solutions to some of the challenges we have in the country, the continent, and the world? So I think definitely young people have a high caliber individuals. They can run pragmatically institutions. They can do that. They may not have um, adopted political ideology that is um, the people of this country are accustomed to, but they can actually run things. So uh, young people, I feel like they have the capacity to do all of this. Running actual systems, let's forget about written leadership, who fought what, who liberated who, mm -hmm. the, the political demographics of this country. But running actual systems, when you open a government website, sometimes they're just little practical things that you see are yeah. missing. If you had young people yeah. in those mm -hmm. um, governance departments, they can actually do this job, practical things, mm -hmm. running management and systems. And I think that the kind of expertise that young people have, like Tato mentioned, in corporate South Africa, you have mm -hmm. young people um, who are in management positions and they are able to run 
their systems. I think those young people should be incentivized to work in the public sector. Mm -hmm. They should be co-opted in all of those processes. Yeah. So I totally agree with, with all of the views we're getting so far. Um, but there's just one, one bone. I'd like to pick it with you, Mfumo, right? Okay. So we've got the challenge. Um, particularly, I'll take you back to, to the protests that we've had in the country, in particular the Fees Must Fall protest, where we saw a lot of young emerging activists coming out you know, and speaking for students and, and, and. Yeah. Um, so we have that, right? We've got these young people who are capable, who we can see that you know, they've got the potential to lead. But then there's the question of having, um, for lack of a better word, a handler. So Sydney's this great leader. He's upright, he's outspoken, has the potential to lead, but has an older someone who yeah. dictates and leads and tells him what he should do, what he shouldn't do, right? Yeah. And Sydney uses protests and leadership as a stepping stone to get or to achieve his political aspirations. What are your views on that? Yeah, I mean, definitely, I mean, transfer of power and experience, you know, is just that big gap that exists, you know, between like the old and the, and the young, you know, and I do think that also that gap gets to um, like, get exacerbated, especially when for like a protest like S SRC or Fees Must Fall, you get to notice certain leaders, you get to notice certain individuals who have, or at least possess capabilities to be in leadership, you know. But then after that Fees Must Fall moment, you know, they have to stay like years, 10 years, 15 years before they can emerge again, you know, into governance or political spaces. So it's a little bit tricky, you know, to yeah. close up that um, that gap and that handler um, 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 conversation. But I do think that in terms of quality, I do think quality exists, you know, I think capabilities also exist. I just do think that if we can maybe potentially close that con uh, that gap, but also it's very context-based, you know. Mm. For example, for us, South Africa, you know, we have a rich history, uh, or at least uh, an unfortunate history, rather, we're of apartheid, you know, and then we move into like a new form of governance, you yeah. know, yes, and that form of governance is new in terms of actually being in power, but mm -hmm. then you then realize that those individuals are actually old, right, mm -hmm. but also you'll see the gap that they've been waiting for, Bona, from the time where we're going th or living through apartheid, you know, mm -hmm. and there was a time, you know, your former Mr. President Nelson Mandela, you know, they've served time like 27 years, I think, in prison. Um, I'm not sure of the, of the years, but like, yeah, you yeah. see that the time spent mm -hmm. for them to actually get into leadership yeah. is the gap that I do think we need to at least close. You close know? up, right? Yeah. And I understand that fully. Um, Lindo, you're speaking about um, substance and you know, capability, and if you have the capability to lead, age is just but a superficial factor that we're yeah. looking at, right? But then the challenge that I also have is, especially when we look at South Africa with all of these political parties that we have in particular, if almost every single political party has a youth wing, right? So it, it almost serves as if before you can get to this level, you must first go through this sort of like initiation. You understand what I mean? And w what I struggle to understand in that respect is, is there room for capacitating younger leaders in the country? Is there room for building younger leaders to take up more positions of leadership? It's one thing to speak about capacity, but is there a platform, if you can put it like that, for, for younger yeah. leaders to develop? I think we'll take it to Titan then to Linda. Sure. And for, because I think that there, is plat that there should be platform, that there should be, I think I'm a big proponent of youth wings, mm -hmm. right? Because I think without youth wings, young people would be strangled by the older people the same way they are right now, mm -hmm. right? For example, look at, I think the ANC not having a youth league has been a huge detriment to the country as a whole, right? Mm -hmm. Because un while, while in Julius's days, right, while you may disagree or agree with him, right, he resonated with a huge part of the youth, right? And the youth had a platform, they had an outlet, right? Mm -hmm. What happens when all of them don't have a youth wing is the main body strangles out any youth voice. All you hear is Julius Malema as the leader of the EFF, Cyril yeah. Ramaphosa as the leader of the ANC, and the youth are strangled. And as a result, they can't be cultivated into a culture because they're fundamentally excluded. Yeah. So yeah. Lindo? Um, I think I hear Tato, but what I'm asking myself at present is even with the existence of youth wings, we predominantly interpret the politics of a political party from the national branch with like the older gents and women, mm -hmm. and we 
barely translate or rather trickle down conversations to the youth league. So mm. I still don't know who the most active and outspoken person in the ANC or EFF youth league is until they're probably like in parliament <coughs> and actually have a voice. And so I think um, in spite the existence of these branches, including even women branches, mm. they are always swallowed up by the politics of the main party, which is predominantly where the older people are. Mm. But I think even when we bring in the conversation of handlers, I think there's a potential danger, especially on substance that we must be careful of. Politics predominantly has to do with who you know. Mm -hmm. And if a person has the privilege of having a handler who's quite prominent in the political party, they have ease that doesn't look into substance, mm -hmm. but looks into who they know, exactly. Yeah. And so I think even, wh even while that sounds like a good idea, again, with mo same with most prescriptive measures, when we question the substance, there truly is danger that we need to ensure that if we are going to have handlers, we at least try to mitigate. We'll have more for you after the break. Should we move towards a borderless Africa? I would say open up the borders. To open our borders, it will be committing suicide. That argument or that idea comes from South African exceptionalism. You look into our country, we've got Cyprus Mafia, Israeli Mafia, Nigerian Mafia. What nonsense is that? Well, these are issues that have long existed. Putting South Africa first is not mutually exclusive to looking towards a borderless Africa. I don't think now is, is the right time to do this. Now, this episode of Beyond the Truth would not have been possible had it not been for the sponsorship of the National Film and Video Foundation. What we're discussing today, should age matter when it comes to political leadership or should we open the doors for more young leaders? Be sure to add your opinions at Mountaintop Productions on all social media platforms and head over to YouTube to subscribe, like and add your comments. Now, the question that I have, I, I don't know if you want to take a jab at it, Tato. Um, has to do with stereotypes associated with young people, right? And to give it a bit of context, during the very recent nationwide protests uh, where we saw looting and burning of malls and an end, um, it was very common to see a young person breaking into a liquor store and having their way with the booze, right? Um, hence, it takes us back to the question around the caliber of young people that we have in South Africa in particular, um, with all of these different challenges that we have and with all of these different stereotypes. How do we address that? And how do we capacitate more young leaders to take on positions of leadership, even if you don't have a title, but even at a simple level, such as a community? So one, one of the re things I think you, know, you can cultivate young people is the same way. Like one, young people hopefully get an education, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Two, I think that inclusion in um, kind of programs, when government builds a school, when government does a thing, and it's being done by an MEC, for mm. example, right? That MEC knows a young person who's in politics, right? Mm. They can take them into the project so that that young person has the experience of, of someone making decisions in that process, right? Having some decision-making power, right? So for me, cultivating young people in politics is, is, is done in that one way, right? This happens a lot when people find a job. When you find a job, you, are, you become a junior to someone who's already working, right? Mm -hmm. this, seems, this doesn't seem to be a thing that happens in politics. It just seems that when you're old enough, you become a minister, you become an MEC. But what's the difference between you and the guy who's just starting out except the fact that you're older? Hmm. I mean, earlier on you mentioned how um, the type of leadership we have in a particular country or in a particular nation should be representative of the demographics. Okay. And obviously South Africa has a huge number of young people uh, who make up the demographic of mm -hmm. the country. And my question still is, the type of young people we have in South Africa, are we capable? I mean, the five of us in this room is a different argument, but if you go to the most dejected of townships where there's problems of drug abuse, substance abuse, and an end, you find that you find a lot of young people are not even interested in occupying mm. positions of leadership. Not even positions of leadership, not even voting um, for that matter. What do you make of that? So, three things. Firstly, young people are not unitary. We are not just a faceless crowd of mm -hmm. the same kind of people. We are very diverse. Mm -hmm. Young people, secondly, are smart and we are grounded in the right uh, ideology. When you see the change that has been coming out in South Africa and elsewhere, mm -hmm. movements that are coming up, they're being led by young people who, for a lack of a better word, are woke. Young people care about all the isms <laughs> that exist and they care more about holding leadership to uh, account. So mm -hmm. young people are very much capable. The thing 
that is happening, I think um, leaders that exist now are just painting the youth with one brush. And mm. we are more than just fashion and social media. Mm. Actually, we use those mediums to mm. uh, amplify our message. Mm. For example, you saw with the Met Gala, AOC was wearing a gown that said text the rich and it ironically it was white. I think it was also referring to something else. Mm. But the yeah. youth <laughs> the youth is dynamic. I think that's what the the older people, the older generation mm. used to study the caliber of like youth leadership that exists mm. and co-opt us into processes. Fumo, the youth is dynamic, the youth can advance change, but the youth are not trusted. How do we build confidence in the type of young people that we have? Yeah, I mean, I think I also we need to also be very careful with how also painting the youth with one brush, you know, because I think Mikateko is correct in saying that we're very diverse, and especially South African youth, you know. Um, and I think also we also need to recognize that our diversity also comes from the failures of the existing government, you know. So the young people that you speak about, you know, who for example, took the opportunity to loot um, during the time of looting, you know. We, there's a huge chat around the fact that they have no jobs, they are, they are stuck in, in a cycle of perpetual poverty. The only thing that's left for them is to loot, you know. So I do think that we also need to be slightly considerate and careful with how we speak of young people in South Africa, especially given the circumstance that we find ourselves in. Um, I do think we do have the capacity, definitely. I mean, um, I do think opportunity again, you know. But as I still die on the hill that um, experience needs to be transferred, you know, and it, it must be transferred gapless because it just gaps going over and over again, you know, and I do think that for us to also overcome those gaps is what Tato was saying, you know, capacitate the next person who's coming after you, you know, to say, this is what you need to do, this is how you do, you do it, but also open up opportunities, you know, like um, when we speak of representation, but also representation of dem demographics, you know, we're not necessarily only speaking on age, you know, we're speaking about, like, for example, women in spaces of political uh, leadership, you know, in spaces of governance, you know, mm -hmm. people living with disabilities you know, um, black people uh, in, in, in spaces, for example, such as governance as well. So we, those factors, in addition to age, you know, somewhat also hinder young people. So I do think that that's one thing we Before bringing the conversation to, to Lindo, in, in terms of policy, in terms of mandating it, in terms <coughs> of making it compulsory, right? Yeah. How does it look? How do we do it from a policy perspective? Yeah. Right? I mean, how do you force people to say, 50% uh, of the people that are leading this country should be young people? How do you drive it to that point? I mean, policy, I th when we speak on policy, and I think more so on legislature, I think it exists. You know, the, the execution of, if, of it is just terrible. You know, like, if you look at their laws, you know, um, we have one of the best constitutions, you know, that at least set out and gave room for people to have an opportunity to exist in the space, you know. Mm -hmm. So I do think that the execution of those policies are a little bit poor, you know, and that we can then maybe put it on the, um, the governance of, or the ruling party as we speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think just to speak especially on deconstructing stereotypes, one thing that I 100% advocate for is the renewing of people's mind, especially yeah. through truth that breaks a lot of stereotypes, especially the ones that we have internalized, even yeah. subconsciously. Um, shameless plug, I have a platform called We Are Monday People, which specifically looks at that specific purpose. Um, and the point is to help people understand that you are unfortunately ghettoized into that particular circumstance yeah. and to appreciate the truth that you don't deserve to be poor, that you don't deserve to be labeled lazy because you're poor and that you have every entitlement to a better life and try to find opportunities and as well as organizations that bring opportunities to you in order for you to break that cycle. The second thing is also taking accountability with certain stereotypes. Um, I personally have a problem, for instance, with the SRC and how they run a lot of their work. So for instance, we all at this point know that the problem of people requiring financial assistance at the beginning of the year mm -hmm. is a problem that is recurring, right? And so it is no longer justified for the student organization in any university to say our very emphasized means of trying to get help for the student populace is to protest. What are you doing 
after the university has pacified you into stop protesting mm -hmm. the entire year to try to get sufficient assistance for the student populace because you can't come back and say this university no longer wants to assist students therefore we'll protest and then after the protest say we've now been able to raise money why couldn't you raise money during the year mm -hmm. so that you are having a better and more constructive conversation mm -hmm. with the university you know what speaks to capacity of yeah. SRCs and just to chip into that in particular, in most colleges and universities, when it's election time, yeah. you'll find a lot of the SRC people who are associated or aligned to political organizations, yeah. leaning obviously to the political organizations yeah. for financial support, to canvas, to yeah. get out and, and get votes. Um, and that always results in, unfortunately, <laughs> that stereotype will always hang over, over SRCs because they are younger leaders, right? Um, on the one end, you want more youth leaders, but on the other end, you depend on your older leaders to give you solutions to problems that you can solve yourselves. Mm. What do you make of that, Tato? So, I mean, two things, right? I think, one, it's, you know, it's harder to raise money, to respond to that. It's harder to raise money when there's no pressure, right? That's why, that's why those things happen when there is pressure, right? Um, however, having said that... By right, pressure, you're referring to protests. Not, not protest when specifically, there's when, there's a, when there's a need, right? Mm -hmm. So there's only, a, the, the protest becomes there because there are many people waiting in line because they need funding, they need all of these, and we can't help them. Mm -hmm. That's why protests usually happen. It's when student leaders are like, we've done all we could, right? So there's a protest. So that's, so that's the, the, the one thing. However, having said that, right, I do think that like, the intergenerational mix thing that, that people like to talk about, having older people and younger people, isn't necessarily a bad thing. It becomes a, it's a bad thing in this country because the older people use the one young person that they have who may or may not represent young people mm -hmm. to, to, to quell the other people. Be like, no, you guys, you have representation, right? And therefore, they don't give us what we need, right? They don't give us what we need. All, they, all you have is one person who has access to all of these big organizations mm -hmm. and they're used as the youth who then quell, who then like kind of undermines the entire our interests? I, I have think. I have a slight problem with um, uh, the response that Tato gives. So I think the reason I'm not entirely convinced that it's difficult to raise money unless there's a need is because, like I first mentioned, the need when it comes to financial assistance is a recurring one since 2016. But secondly, I think with fees must fall in particular, I think it's honestly become a political legitimacy hinge for SRCs. It's almost like if you don't have a fees must fall protest, you mm -hmm. weren't an actual SRC that represented the student populace because it's difficult to prove that you are working and doing work in boardrooms that aren't visible to the media mm -hmm. and to students. So I think it's become a hinge to prove political legitimacy mm -hmm. because we know that financial aid is a serious need. Mm -hmm. And that's just the one problem that I do have with um, student bodies. But don't you think, um, I, I do think that also many things can be true at the same time, you know, so That's what true. you're saying is true, and I think what also what you're saying is true, but I do think <coughs> the, for me, is that the political legitimacy comes in when there's a need, so um, for example, registration time, you know, many students passed well um, metric, you know, but they want to continue with their uh, the schooling, you know, these institutions say it's 50% or nothing, or fa pay the whole full reg for you to have access, you know, and the need then comes in when they are privileged counterparts, you know, go in, register, go in and get what they want, but then the, 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 the disadvantaged minority or majority, actually in this case, then gets forced and those people go to SRC leaders say, I can't register, I can't do this, you know, and for them, sure, they will take it as a, look, this is our chance to shine, but I do think that at some point in time, they need to also represent the blacks, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. The challenge that I have with, with the discussion, not digressing too much into fees must fall into SRCs, mm -hmm. goes back to the question that I asked earlier on. What do we make of young leaders, young capable leaders, who use platforms such as SRC or their community-based mm -hmm. organizations where they are young leaders, and they use those as stepping stone, literally stepping on other young people just for them to get ahead, right? Does that show capacity on, on the side of younger leaders in terms of how universities and colleges and SRCs or uh, however we can put it are run? Mm -hmm. um, the mere fact that you're able to use someone else as your stepping stone to get ahead, 
right? How do we make of that? And how does that even ensure any form of legitimacy? I mean, we should just separate, you know. Um, politics is very dirty, you know. That's one, also we need to be very honest with the conversation that politics is not a clean game. It's not one that we can sit and discuss, you know. Mm -hmm. People want positions, people want power, you know. But there's then leadership, you know, which is, can you do the work? You know, Tato was saying something to me outside that you can be the most dumbest person, but at least care, you know, mm -hmm. care enough to do the work. Care with care enough. capacity. I mean, yeah, because obviously you get into position, you have no capacity, you have no record, you are just there because of connections, you know? Mm. But like, if at the very least we can hold you to that level, would say, you care, and you care that you someone gets job, you know, and we hold you accountable for that. I don't know how I feel about caring without capacity, Tato. No, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily caring without capacity, mm -hmm. but it's the idea that, like, you can be held accountable. Mm. I'll, we'll talk about the guy who steps on other people to get ahead, right? Yeah. That that person, in my view, can be accountable to no one. Mm -hmm. Therefore, is not a youth. In most cases, is not won't be a youth representative, mm -hmm. right? And it goes back to what Mingo was saying, right? Youth is used in is a double-edged sword, right? Because they say there's youth representation as if we're all represented by one person, right? Yeah. Which we all like, but it's also used as a as a way to kind of shut us up, mm. right? And I think. For, for all of the people who step on young people and step on young people's interests in order to advance their needs, it becomes very uh, important for us to be aware that this person is a young person, but not a youth representative. Mm. I mean, earlier on, we spoke, we spoke about um, the ANC during the, the NC Youth League, rather, during the era of Julius Malema and how a lot of young people resonated with him and, and, and. Mm. Um, and in a few years to come, let's say for argument's sake that the EFF does win elections and Julius Malema is 64, 65 years of age. Do you think he's going to want to let go of that position of power um, the same way he wants to be in power now? No. Um, no. Yes and no. <laughs> I don't think, <laughs> I don't think okay, he'll want to, then Fumo? I don't think he'll want to let go of that power, right? Mm. But the true test, this, which is why this conversation is brilliant, mm. the true test... But he's capacitated. The, the true test, I don't know about that, but the true <laughs> test for me is whether there is youth representation, right? Mm -hmm. And just like I made the distinction about between that young person and youth representation, it's quite possible that Manlema might represent a lot of what the youth need at 65 years old, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of what that youth might need is representation across government. Maybe he's the mm -hmm. only 65 year old and everyone about That's the is younger, mm -hmm. right? So yes, age is a problem right now, but age is a problem when it's only endemic, when everyone's old. Mm -hmm. Bring it to Mfumo. Yeah, I mean, the reason why I say yes and no, because also depends on the climate that time, you know, because mm -hmm. Tato is right in that Julius Malema could be rapping everyone, you know, to say that you are represented, I got all your interests, um, I'm covered in our political mm -hmm. party, you know. But it's also a no at the same time because of those gaps I was speaking about, you know, because mm -hmm. if we're going to speak about um, 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 CIC Julius is that he was in the ANC, in the youth division, and was calling out for positions and being included, you know, and then whenever the drama happened, you know, he opted out to start his own political party mm -hmm. and, and contest the election, you know, so it depends when then it happens and the climax there um, would determine if we would feel represented there. But also we can test him as well, you know, to say, okay, what you were speaking about years back, are you doing it now? So then we hold him accountable. Mm -hmm. but yeah. I, I Holding think, someone yeah. accountable, yeah. Yeah. and then Minkatego? And I think accountability is honestly something that is conditionalizing a lot of the youth's involvement. Because when we look at the uh, previous national elections, we had a great number of young individuals that didn't vote. And if Julius was the man who mostly represented the youth generation, then clearly there was a problem even with the respect or extent to which the youth is confident in his leadership enough to then offer him his vote. And so at that point, even what he was offering wasn't sufficient. And I think it does come down to accountability. You may say things that more or less sound like they represent us, but mm. substance definitely does conditionalize Let's give it to me, guys, before you go to an outbreak. Continuing on the theme of substance, I think that um, what's hindering substance is the precedent of veteran leadership mm -hmm. um, that they previously spoke about and how it's being co-opted by young leaders, especially uh, the way it manifests itself in student leadership. I think it's regrettable that young people are clinging so much to political parties, even if they may create wings within, within those political parties. My problem is they are setting themselves up to be proxy 
to the older generation. Mm -hmm. And the problem that the reason why I think we're even talking about all of this is because the older generation is gatekeeping yeah. power and the gatekeeping power without uh, capacity like for change. Mm -hmm. And then that is the mm -hmm. initial problem in my view. After the break, we discuss whether or not political organizations do even have young people's interests at heart. We have more for you after this. Should we move towards a borderless Africa? I would say open up the borders. To open our borders, it will be committing suicide. That argument or that idea comes from South African exceptionalism. You look into our country, we've got Cyprus Mafia, Israeli Mafia, Nigerian Mafia. What nonsense is there? Well, these are issues that have long existed. Putting South Africa first is not mutually exclusive to looking towards a borderless Africa. I don't think now is, is the right time to do this. Welcome back, you're still watching Beyond the Truth. Now we're asking the question, should age matter when it comes to political leadership or should older leaders give more room to younger leaders? Now during the break, we, we had an exchange and Minkata, we had a question for Tato, you can fire right away. I think it's regrettable that when we speak about political participation or generally politics, it's always in context to allegiance to a political party. And I think that is hindering the it's hindering independent candidates to spring up and run for office, especially in context of the uh, constitutional court judgment that was released allowing for independent candidates to run for, for office. So if we are having such a huge trouble um, bringing independent candidates into the mix at national level, it's becoming even more, it's even more difficult at student uh, leadership level. So why can't independent candidates run and actually win? What's, what's wrong yeah. with the system there? Honestly, it's because there's one of you, right? Mm -hmm. um, the way a campaign looks is, I am part of an organization. I'll speak about my specific experience. I was part of the PUA at WITS. There were 700 members and may maybe more supporters, right? So we go, we meet, we have, a we have a campaign plan. So when I'm in class, someone is talking to someone about me, even though I'm running, right, with the list. All of the time, there's always someone outside, whenever they have free time, saying, Tata Mukwena and her 15, of his p 15 of his colleagues are running all the time, from 8 a.m. till 11 p.m. at night. Just to chip in there, Tato, are they, are, they, are they voicing out your name? Are they speaking for Tato because of Tato's capability? Or are they speaking for Tato because of Tato's allegiance to a particular political structure? I mean, there's, it's both of them, right? Because, I, like I said, there were 700 members, right? I had to have the capacity to be one of the 15 that get to be elected, mm -hmm. right? So it, but it is also the fact that we're in the same organization because someone did lose to me and they're obviously bitter about that, mm -hmm. but they still support me, right? So yeah, and that's, that's why um, independents don't win at university. That's why I don't think they'll win in an, an actual election, right? But it doesn't mean there's an absence of substance in those independent in candidates. That's fine, they will still lose. Which leads us to the following question. Do you believe that political organizations actually do have the interests of young people at heart. We're having, so we're having two distinct conversations, right? One of them is around opening more for young leaders to occupy space, and the other one is around substance, right? That they should be capable enough to lead, irregardless of whether they're old or not. But looking at all the challenges that we have in the country, and there's so many, you can think of your own examples. Um, a few years ago when the Youth League was disbanded from the ANC, when we see all of these challenges in the Democratic Alliance itself with more younger leaders leaving, um, do you believe that political organizations do have the actual interests of young people at heart? Um, I don't think so. I think people, young people leaving firstly is indicative of that. It shows that they tested mm, the sure substance of whether they have a place and it clearly didn't work. Mm -hmm. But I think secondly, a lot of the political parties are consumed by the stigma of age that we're actually discussing, mm -hmm. right? So age is perceived to come with wisdom, which isn't true. Wisdom is what brings wisdom and not age. Mm -hmm. um, but 100%. <laughs> but secondly, I think um, there's also a weird perception on like political smartness that older people who especially were a lot more active in like older times that younger people didn't have the privilege to be a part of because they weren't born, for example, um, they tend to uh, be excluded from the 
consideration of who's qualified enough to be a prominent part of the political party. So I do think that there isn't very much a place for them except just to um, self-face and to pacify them, to say, like Tato and Minka said, we have one youth person, you see, we care about your interests, whereas that doesn't even speak to a lot of substance. It doesn't represent the demographics, yeah. as Minka yeah. was saying. Yeah. On that, are we not also overplaying the institutional memories that older leaders have? Because yeah. we're always saying, oh, they have experience, they have led before, but they exactly, have political credentials. exactly what is their experiences living during a time of struggle, apartheid, uh, colonization, all of that. They led liberation movements, they mm. brought us liberation democracy. We are grateful. But the methodology with which they were using to fight back then is no longer relevant mm. or necessary now. Mm. And they are making everyone else who wants to step into leadership to uh, take this mentality of being a veteran, mm. you, we don't need to be veterans now. So you're arguing that they're not sensitized to the realities of today? If I may because add Because they were on, leading yeah. towards a liberation. If I may add on, I also have a problem with the militancy, inherent militancy, which exists within political parties, because mm. that militancy follows a culture of um, uh, non-compliance. Non mm. mm. For us to be brought out of that a horrific era of apartheid. Yes. It had to. We had to come up with a culture of non-compliance, meaning that you had to boycott uh, paying uh, houses, your house rent, and things like that. You mm. had to create a situation where South Africa was unga ungovernable, mm. right? Non-compliance. Yes. Um, but now we no longer need non-compliance to yes. progress. I think right now the youth that is following that uh, that path, the reason why there's destruction of property when the protest is because they think in order for us to progress, we must. Not not comply mm. with the rules and I think that's a dangerous precedent. And we'll get, we'll get to that in, in a minute but still on the question of whether or not political organizations and political parties have the interests of it's young people. It's tricky because out. the immediate answer is no right mm -hmm. but the trick is right at some point they kind of have to mm. or we have to change the way we elect people mm. right because unfortunately political parties are here with us and they're here to stay Right, so they're either gonna, we're either going to go and force our way in be, somehow because we have to find expression at some point, mm -hmm. or we're going to continue to be excluded. Right, mm -hmm. and I say it's tricky because as young people we always struggle because you, you'll go, but then when you go, you know you're going to be excluded, you know you're going to be undermined, you know that generally this isn't a space for you. Mm -hmm. But the more it's like that. Yeah, just the more you, the youth is underrepresented. Mm. So I don't really have an answer, but I know that it's tricky. Mm. Do you find that young people who are in strategic government or leadership positions in these political organizations, do they even have a voice? Are they able to change anything? Yeah. Or is their voice, did they have a voice in the first place or were they taken because, ah, you can give us, you can get us a million votes, so we'll put you in a, in a position of leadership. Yeah, and I mean, I just also quickly just want to answer that because mm. I do think that they do have their interest at heart, you mm. know, of young people. It's just very conditional, you know, because if you think about it, young people in, um, like in in electoral terms, uh, a whole electorate. So they have voting power. You know, so um, political parties care about having young people going to the polls, right? Mm -hmm. So I do think the interest is very conditional. I do think that the individuals who are in the young, in, in I mean, in positions and as and being young, are faced with immense pressure. You know, mm -hmm. like they have to deal now with the fact that they have to be held accountable, but also they have to redo mistakes of the generation that was there before them. You know, mm -hmm. so I do think also we need to at least afford them a little bit of you know um, courtesy. But I do think that they have a lot on their plate because and as it goes back to the chat that we're having about they they will set they will pacify you and say look there's one person and that one person has immense pressure now to represent everyone even when their main intention was never to even represent mm. people in the first place you know mm. so this is why Lindy Way for example left the DA you know people left um, the ANC you know because now they feel like okay now I'm taking on responsibility that was inherently not mine you mm. know yeah I mean Minka Togo makes a very interesting point about how um, South Africa obviously comes from a history where they've had, or we've had, to use militants and a militant approach to overthrow the apartheid government, but you still see that militancy play itself out, especially during, during protests. Now we're sitting now, um, then this is, this is from, from one episode that we had, about 750,000 kids dropping out of, of school, right? Um, what do you think that looks like for the South Africa tomorrow? Even if we do have a capable young leader that will emerge, 
the challenges that we're facing today that are being created, obviously, by the older leaders um, for argument's uh, sake, um, is it possible that an emerging young leader will be able to solve these challenges in the future? What would they have to do? Where would they have to go? How does it look? Um, I think that the challenges firstly will likely change if a lot of the youth is dropping out of educational institutions. It points to a different problem dynamic or mm -hmm. one that might even be similar to um, the problems faced by the present youth that isn't at school. But I don't think that that means that the problem isn't solvable. I think um, if you're in a position of leadership, you are in a place where you have resources um, dispensed to you in order for you to make meaningful impact. It may not necessarily happen immediately, but I don't think that that takes away the question of whether or not you have capacity mm. to solve a problem, but it may just change the yeah. nature of the problems. Yeah, and I mean, I think also that for me, it's also, um, I just coined a term in my head right now, um, <laughs> legacy politicking, you know, like yeah. I just feel like um, people, um, especially political parties, you know, re we rely so much on legacy, especially, for example, um, the ruling party will tell you apartheid and how we did that, you know, and that's how, they, for example, they will reach out to that different type of electorate, you know. So, Lindo is correct that the problems will be very different, you know, but also the problems, if met with the same leadership right now, will be potentially worse, you mm -hmm. know. And again, it, it goes back to what I was saying, that then it puts pressure on those young people then to say, I, why is this, why am I involved in this mess, you know, yeah. type of situation, you know. So I do think, um, yeah, it does change back to that, yeah. Mm. Mm. On the issue of young people dropping out of school, that is a ticking time bomb that worries me to yeah. the core, seriously. But I think there is a solution in that regard. It means that young people, it's becoming difficult for them to stay within the schooling system and it's regrettable that it's happening at high school. Uh, university dropouts, those exist, but we're not paying attention to them. But in high school, if they're dropping out at high school, we need to charter a different path. So it yeah. means we need to dis stigmatize vocational training and learning yeah. and we need to t channel them into those industries to let them know uh, in order to participate in politics in these kinds of conversations, you don't need to have gone to vets, mm. to UJ. So we shouldn't also gate, gatekeep the conversation, up, yeah, the yeah. conversation mm. and participation. Mm. We need to affirm other forms of education. Mm. I'm glad that you refer to it as a taken time on Tato. Yeah, I'm partially covered. But yeah. I think the answers are very... The, what reasons do people have to stay in school, right? Except, mm. like, study. Think about it. Mm. Uh, you know, um, the country, Dr. Kumalo, when they won the 96 World Cup, Dr. Kumalo was discovered in Soweto at a school, right? That w can't happen in 2021 at, at a government school, right? Because we simply don't play sport. We don't do all of these things. So schools have become much like prisons, right? The, you're there to do one thing. It isn't a holistic development thing, right? Mm. It, it, and for me, that's the issue. That's the first issue. The first issue is our schools simply don't develop people. They, tr they teach people how to do maths and all of that, which is very, very important, and I think school's primary purpose. Mm. However, you're teaching people, and mm. people are holistic. Yeah, I think we're having an interesting discussion. Um, before I say what I was about to say, Lindo? Um, I, I, I would like to say I firstly 100% agree with both of you, but I think one thing I would like to advocate about the place of the formal schooling system at present is also unfortunately ch tied to a challenge. South mm. Africa hasn't moved out of emphasizing formal education as the condition for getting employment. Mm. And so unfortunately, the formal schooling education does have a place for that particular reason. Do high school to get to university so you can guarantee a better chance at mm, getting a job. Sense. Not mm. the only chance, but a better chance because mm. unfortunately, we haven't moved from emphasizing critical thinking mm. and creative skills. The emphasis is on what, what you can get, not on you know what you can exactly. learn and what yeah. you can use 100%. for your own self gain. Yeah. One last question and then I'm gonna throw it to all of you before we draw towards a wrap. Um, another stereotype, and you'll forgive me for it. Um, one that has to do earlier on with speaking about social media and you know all of these other all of these other things. Self glory, self gratification, wanting to be seen, wanting to be seen, popping bottles on Instagram and just being that young person. How do we go about identifying whether or not someone truly is a capable leader? Because you never really know. 
until they are in a position of leadership, right? You never know that Sydney's gonna take 500 million rands for himself until he takes the 500 million rands. Is there a tool to gauge whether or not someone is competent or capable? You can be a brilliant activist, a great SLC leader, you can do great work in your community until you get a position of power, and then everything goes south from there. We care too much about keeping up appearances. We do. <laughs> it, it has become so difficult to filter who's real, who's not. Yeah. I would be lying if I said I had an answer on how we know who's genuine and who's not. Mm. But also, there's a, a thing of evidence if you if you can follow someone's path. So mm. the only problem I have is that we are deciding who should get uh, political leadership positions on the basis of who you have allegiance to, uh, that bench of honor as a veteran, that's yeah. my problem. But you can still assess somebody's capability from other industries, you just need to follow um, exactly their actions, what they have done, mm -hmm. and then elect them into leadership. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Amika Tegra. I also think it's um, branding as well. You know, I think um, it, it doesn't make sense you are a minister of finance, but you're popping bottles on Instagram. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, yeah, and the thing is, it just, we need to, I think they themselves as leaders, you know, they need to brand themselves as that, okay, now I'm a serious person, I'm holding a position of power, you know, I can't be doing those things, you know. Um, and I do think a lot of politicians lack personal branding, but secondly, they don't invest in people who can brand them, you know. Pay people or pay people to deal with your, how you appear on social media. Pay people to deal with, for example, your styling, your, there's, there's categories around how mm -hmm. you as an individual can appear in public. Because Mkateko is correct that we do care about how we appear in public, you know. You want to appear as your best version, and your best version always exists when people work around you, you know. Mm -hmm. So I do think that, sure, we may not be able to judge politicians or young leaders on the basis of I mean, in, uh, invaluable things such as Instagram and posting um, 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 good lifestyle, you know, but there's, you know, there's social media etiquette that they need to learn, you know. Yeah. There, is, um, um, there is political etiquette and political office etiquette that they may also need to learn. So it's those small things that they may need to fix, but definitely experience, you know, it's one of them, you know, uh, being able to do the job, you know, yeah. and I think for me and Tato Vele, you just need to care. Yeah. Because I find it weird yeah. that you can be in an overall in parliament and then you can be out there holding a 15,000 rand bottle in your hand. Yeah. You know? um, so two things for me. I think one, what Mfuma says is very important. I think having a decent public image matters because when we look at any political context, people always care about the person that they're also supposed to vote for because people are people and we relate to them as such. Mm. So for instance, in America, they want to know, like, is this official married? What are they like as a father, as a mm. mother, as a parent? All of those things matter because they reflect some idealistic, I guess, a nature that people are also attracted to. Mm. But in terms of like a tool we can use to therefore measure people's capacity that isn't as superficial and orchestrated mm. as social media. A solution that I'd proffer is honestly a political general knowledge test where you're asked about things that are, I guess, just con contextually relevant. Yeah. Um, what was the biggest, I, I guess, like economic downfall that occurred? What solution would you proffer? Um, what would you borrow from the policies of X or Y uh, president in the mm. past? And what would you change that they did in the administration? Mm. Things that show that you are engaging critically and intellectually mm. with governance and politics and economic, social economic If matters. we gave that test to our 400 plus M uh, members of parliament, do you think they would pass I'm the curious. 40%, 50%? Yeah, but also we need to have to ha like a 65% pass rate. Like we need not people to pass on a margin, we need people who are actually capacitated. So that's my solution. Right, so interesting, interesting arguments that they come with, right? Very interesting how they speak about uh, personal branding mm -hmm. and why it is, it, it is important for you to keep up like a good image and an example that is being done in the US where they want to know about your track record and, and, and. In this country in particular, if you want to get political power, if you want to get political office, you have to go to a conference, and then when you get to that conference, something needs to be done for you, right? Yeah. You need to take a bag and open up and be like, show me the money, dog. Um, how do we deal with that challenge, right? Because you can have a negative public image, but then you can buy votes. You can literally get people to vote and support you simply because of who you know and what you can control. So how, we do, how do we deal with that challenge? Sure, and I think two things, right? Um, the first one is I agree with everyone, but there's a, an, issue, a, an issue of values that we need to talk about. And there's no real way to test values. Mm. So the only way you deal with someone's values 
is mm. to have ways to constantly hold them accountable, oh, okay. right? Mm. It's the only way. You can't test them before. You can only test it after. Yeah. I don't know if you're going to steal. I know once you've stole that you've stolen, mm. right? The issue is we can't do anything about like it. There's no sense that you can pick up the eye. That's why. Yeah, and I think the issue in this country is that for most of the time we can't do anything about it. Mm. And that's the issue. It, and it relates to the second point, the, the question you're asking me. How do we deal with the issue of people can just buy a, con a conference? The first thing is, like, our political parties have a delegate system mm. where 3,000 people go and vote, right? No matter how big the party is. If the party has a million members, only 3,000 people go. Mm. They vote for the leaders before and the people vote for the leaders. He, here's what I say. I say one member, one vote as a first measure of, of, of accountability, right? Because, for example, if the ANC has 60 officials, the millionth member doesn't know all of mm. them, right? So when they're voting, right, their vote is based on their own experience. So they can vote for people that they have seen, right? That's the first measure of accountability that they know and see, right? But secondly, I'm not sure why voting for um, party political presidents isn't open to the public, mm. actually. I'm not sure why that isn't, right? Because ultimately, these are the people who are going to be our leaders, mm. right? Julius Malema is going to be the, an MP in parliament. Mm. So why isn't the EFF election open to the public? Yeah. Because maybe they know something that we don't know. That if they open it up to the public, then the public might decide otherwise, right? So we're drawing towards a close. Final thoughts on the topic. Should age matter or should we let the old reign till kingdom comes? Just your two cents quickly on that. I maintain my initial thoughts. There needs to be a hybrid of leadership, but it <laughs> must not compromise substance, as was previously said. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have a hybrid of leadership. Definitely, I mean, strike a balance. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think we need to strike a balance. We need to make sure that everyone is represented. You know, uh, everyone at least has an opportunity to even um, try to campaign or, uh, or, or contest the election. So mm -hmm. let's just be able to strike a balance. Mm -hmm. yeah. Linda, you still believe that capacity should count more than age? 100%. I think age is super superficial, and so we should question the substance and intellect of individuals, especially including the political general knowledge test. Pass the <laughs> test, <laughs> and then we'll talk. Finally, Tato. Sure. Um, I think that there's, um, we can't throw away old people, I think, right? That's the f and because they have experience, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a lot of the time where the old, older people should exist, right? I think there should be space for younger people. And I think older people shouldn't feel the need to lead. However, they can be involved, right? We need their level of experience because mm -hmm. they've done this before, right? They don't need to be president, but they can be there as whatever, mm -hmm. yeah. Are you young or are you old? Are you for or are you against? Be sure to add your comments on all social media platforms at Mountaintop Productions. Also remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also add your comments on what you think about the day's topic. Now, it would be a sin of me not to thank once more our sponsor, the National Film and Video Foundation. That's it from us today. 